We have another panel coming up here. The diversity of healthcare challenges in the United States is resulting in a diversity of solutions. So the challenge for our next panel is to begin to sort through some of these solutions as they relate to um, collaborative care models and mobilizing community resources to address some of the complexities and the challenges that we've um, been talking about during the course of the day. Uh, Jason Helgerson is gonna lead this panel. Uh, Jason is a new member of the Health Systems Innovation Advisory Board. Um, he's the founder of a consulting firm called Helgerson Solutions Group, a company created to help organizations commit to improving health and social care outcomes and delivering health care more cost effectively. Previous to that, Jason was the Medicaid director in New York State and in Wisconsin. And prior to his work with Medicaid, he held a series of positions in state and local government leading efforts to reform education, child care, public finance, and of course, health care. So um, Jason, if you can manage the, the, the panel effectively, we should have time for two or three questions from the audience at the end, <laughs> All right. and would you please introduce the panel? Certainly, well thank you. It's certainly, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and uh, being, had the opportunity to set, sit through the, the morning sessions, uh, know this is such a, a, a thoughtful, intelligent audience that we definitely want to get to your questions, and so in that spirit, um, we don't have any slides to present, uh, which means we're, yeah? So we're definitely going to be about dialogue and conversation here, uh, and uh, so, but a great panel uh, today um, to talk about collaborative care um, in healthcare, which is interesting because it's a it's a topic while um, like patient-centered healthcare, uh, people throw the word collaboration around a lot, but it is sort of up to uh, the eye of the beholder in terms of how it's defined. Uh, but I think we've got a really interesting panel who come at this question from different perspectives. Uh, we've got one of the largest healthcare companies uh, in the United States uh, uh, represented on this panel. We also have a disruptor, an organization relatively new to the healthcare landscape who's really disrupting care in meaningful and important ways. And we also have someone who's on the front lines of healthcare uh, running a fairly qualified health center um, and, uh, and knows firsthand the challenges, particularly for some of our complex and vulnerable populations, and, and really sees where uh, collaboration, um, where it meets, uh, rubber meets the road uh, relative to a collaboration if it's effective. Uh, so first off, I'll introduce Andrew Bertinoli, who is the Vice President for Behavioral Health uh, in clinical, for, and Clinical Products at Optum. Uh, that's our, uh, our big uh, nationwide company, which is an arm of United Healthcare. Next, we have Chris Goldsmith. Uh, he's the disruptor. He's the president of Landmark Health, a, uh, a company that's um, uh, definitely on the tops of many people's minds these days because its founder and former CEO, Adam Bowler, is now the head of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, one of the most important uh, jobs in uh, American healthcare. And then uh, we have Valerie Petrie, uh, who is the chief medical officer for Family Health Center of Worcester, uh, who also happens to be an MIT grad. Um, uh, who will talk uh, from the perspective of uh, healthcare at the front lines. So to begin, um, I'll start with my own personal definition of uh, collaborative care, but then uh, I'm very interested to hear my, uh, my colleagues and, and uh, their critique of my definition and uh, how they define collaboration. But I define it as an effort to end fragmentation in healthcare and allow organizations from across the health and social care continuum to work together to provide more cost-effective care. And I'll give but one example of what I mean by cost-effective care. And I'll actually give an example from um, outside of the United States, an example I actually got to see firsthand in the United Kingdom. Uh, and it's simply called the Red Bag Program. Uh, and it was a program that was created at a local level uh, between organizations from across what in the UK they call social care, we call long-term care, and the acute care system who came together uh, to address a problem, uh, which was length of stay uh, for elderly uh, individuals, particularly those who were um, in a nursing home setting. 
And what they realized was that there was a major information disconnect uh, between the acute care system and the long-term care system, and that individuals were, would have a health crisis in the nursing home and then be sent off by ambulance to the hospital for care. But when that person arrived, the hospital had little to no information about uh, that, that person. In fact, would conduct tests um, on that individual that frankly were not necessary. Uh, length of stay was longer, sometimes even for the reason that they didn't even know where the person needed to go home to. Um, also, uh, the dignity of the individual was compromised uh, in meaningful ways. People would come back without their, uh, the clothes that they arrived in, without their teeth, without their glasses. Um, and basically, because the system, the adults running this system uh, couldn't find ways to effectively communicate. And so they solved this problem, um, not with some fancy computer system uh, and some very expensive intervention, but with a simple red bag which was that each time an individual was picked up at a nursing home uh, by the ambulance, there was a red bag that contained specific sets of information about that individual, a number that the uh, ER physician could call to get more information and the basic personal effects of that individual. That initiative, which cost literally zero dollars, in case, their case, zero pounds to implement, reduced length of stay, improved overall health outcomes, and improve the dignity and the quality of life for the individuals impacted. To me, that's just a simple example of what collaboration can be. It doesn't have to be super expensive. Uh, it can really do make a, a difference, not only in healthcare costs, but in quality of life. Uh, and I believe at the end of the day that we need more red bag solutions. Uh, in, and I think that's what could come out of effective collaboration. So with that in mind, I'll turn to my uh, panel to answer my first uh, question is, do you agree with my definition of collaborative care? And if no, if you don't, uh, what, how would you define it? So Andrew, let's start with you. So yes, I agree. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> No. <laughs> Although I would, I, I would add to it. I, I think that uh, the pieces, collaborative care often, you think, oh, it's integration of mental health and physical health. I think sometimes substance use gets left out of the mix, and we've got to keep that in play. Um, I'd also add, as you have, I think, social services, but I'd also expand to things, uh, educational vocational services. Mm. Uh, the justice services. Particularly in the mental health world, many individuals are kind of caught up in all of those things. They've been picked up by the police for psychosis symptoms, they have unstable housing, they don't have employable skills typically, and um, that often impedes their ability to kind of get on a path of recovery. And then the last piece I would add is really the individual, the person. Um, we often forget about the person, but really we've got to look at self-efficacy, motivation, what are the inherent resiliency skills in that person, what do they bring, and how can we leverage those? Yeah. Chris, you want to, what's your perspective on this question? Well, as the, I guess, disruptor, I almost should, I feel compelled to say no, but uh, <laughs> I think, no, in general, very much aligned with the definition and would echo a lot of what uh, Andrew said. I think, you know, to maybe nuance your definition a little bit, uh, you know, kind of talking about allowing that collaboration, I hope we can move to more of a point where it's empowering and incentivizing the collaboration across a lot of the, the different actors mm -hmm. that are impacting that patient. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, it it's, comes back to, yeah, those are all the right pieces, but how do you get those pieces mm -hmm. aligned in a way where they are, you know, doing the right thing for the patient, whether that's a behavioral issue, uh, an opioid issue or, or a physical condition. Valerie? So I guess I'd be a yes and for the definition so far and um, would make a case for broadening um, the definition of health to include well-being and justice as, um, as you mentioned, Andrew, uh, and health equity. Because I think that when we talk about social determinants of health, we're, we're really, if we roll that back to root causes, we're talking about social determinants of justice in some ways. So there's that. And then, then that, that operative word of effort, I think I would probably qualify in saying things like intentional and systemic um, and integrated and connected. But it's, there's um, a need for the effort to have some specificity to it. Great. So next up is uh, maybe a little discussion about what your individual organizations are doing uh, to be collaborative. Um, and uh, starting with, uh, with you, Andrew, 
Uh, you're part of a very large organization that's got uh, got its uh, hands in lots of aspects of, uh, of of healthcare, but you also are directly a leader in probably one of the areas where collaboration. Uh, many people feel, I, myself included, that collaboration is potentially is hugely impactful, which is in be bringing behavioral and physical health together, seeing the whole needs of the individual mind and body. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what Optum's doing in that regard. Sure. So one of the I, I came to Optum about two years ago, and part of that was the development of this new department with inside Optum Behavioral Health that really looked at how do we design clinical products uh, based in a population health philosophy. Prior to that, it was a very classic behavioral health model where we looked at people as typically as they were exiting from some sort of acute care facility and trying to connect them with care and do the right things. Uh, so as a part of that, we began to develop ways to identify and stratify the population using our data systems, uh, mostly from claims. Uh, we're beginning to look at adding other data sources into that ID and strat to allow us to get a sense of not only who is coming out of the hospital, but as they come out of the hospital, who may need a little extra care and a little extra attention and who may not. And then really beginning to look downstream or upstream, I guess is the right way, down the pyramid, up the stream, that's what it is. Um, and how do we, how are we able to use data to identify kind of early warning signs? when someone may be starting to have some difficulty, starting to uh, kind of go off the, the path, and then how can we intervene with them earlier? Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, as a, so that's kind of in this kind of specific behavioral space. And then the other area that we're working on is really beginning to uh, bring uh, this medical behavioral integration and really looking at uh, Eventually, the vision is to not have this medical behavioral divide. It would just be the ID and strat in total. But what we've done there is, again, using data analytics, uh, begun to stratify the population into um, opportunities. So moving away from a, let's screen everyone with diabetes for depression, really looking at uh, combinations of conditions for where there might be increased opportunity for improved management, typically of the behavioral or substance use disorder to uh, improve uh, total the total health and therefore the total cost of care. Great. Chris? Uh, so maybe just a little background on the disruptor and what we're trying to disrupt. We're uh, a employed medical group uh, that takes risk and we send our physicians directly in the home uh, taking care of the most frail and chronically ill patients across the United States. And so for us, uh, collaborative care, you know, I really would break it down into two main uh, vectors. The first is, you know, for our uh, physicians and advanced practice providers are going to the home, we have an employed interdisciplinary team that supports them. So we employ dietitians, we employ pharmacists, social workers, psych NPs, pretty much whatever we think that patient needs, we're going to have that team member available to support that patient. And so we you know, have our own direct collaboration within a given market. And I think the second uh, element of collaborative care that's really important is then how our organization interacts with the community providers. And so we have, you know, whether it's phone calls, texts, emails with their primary care physician, with their key specialists, and also with social services and you know, leveraging that uh, network that exists there. So it's really kind of in two main ways that we try and enable collaborative care. Okay, so the first thing I would say was that um, you can still be in the public and the social sector and be a disruptor. So I'll talk a little bit about a disruptive <laughs> example that we um, have for collaborative care, and that is our school-based health center model. So we are in um, the line of work that includes primary care in public schools, and we partner with the public school system in the town where we practice, which is Worcester, Mass as well as Department of Public Health, which is a sponsoring agency, as well as many community organizations that um, work together with us. And I'd say that at the core of that is this notion that the, per the person in front of you, the patient in front of us, is not going to be the same down the line as they are when we see them today, and that we can see growth, and we can see development, and we can see progress if we get together and work together to identify needs and break down barriers. So, our example has to do with um, us taking on this model where it was primarily a, an episodic care 
model for sore throats and headaches and things like that. And as we started to understand the potential that existed to really begin to get kids engaged in primary care and later on other aspects of care and then branch out into youth development, we began to realize a lot of the potential of a, of a very localized model that was connected to the community. So uh, concrete examples of that include um, integrated behavioral health services, which have been brought into our model now so that we're actually there in the school being able to deliver the behavioral health care to kids in crisis, uh, learning about trauma-informed care and understanding the impact of trauma on kids' ability to learn and exist in a very um, chaotic sometimes, very um, high-pressure environment. That's a service that we can add. Um, and then finally, looking at school success and school completion and graduation rates. And we actually have programs that will take kids that are at highest risk and uh, work together with colleges locally, the YMCA, various um, groups in town to provide tutoring, um, behavioral health uh, wraparound services, family services, as well as college visits and college preparation, and really trying to help kids to see a trajectory that might be new for them um, compared to what they might see around them. So that's been our model. Some of the barriers, I think, for us have been around the collecting of data and then the acting upon that and which screens really identify what risk factors. So we work on that all the time. So. That's great. So that's a, a very broad uh, view of collaboration, getting into the not only just the social determinants of health, but into key societal metrics, things like high school graduation mm -hmm. rates, which may not have as much of a corollary with direct health outcomes as, as other measures, but clearly have an effect on someone's likelihood of success in life. And, and I, what I really love is the idea of the healthcare sector beginning to say, hey, we're part of the greater society and we need to be focused on those measures as well. Mm -hmm. So my, uh, my next uh, and my last uh, sort of uh, for initial question here for this panel is, um, so we've talked about some of the benefits um, of collaboration. We talked about what each organization is doing to, to, to drive collaboration. But why is that collaboration, uh, why isn't it just endemic to the system today? Why is it uh, more the exception, not the rule uh, in American healthcare? Mm -hmm. If uh, there's some clearly some benefits to patients, providers, to the community, to society of that collaboration. So, so in terms of those impediments, start with you, Andrew. You can start with the disruptor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, think, I, I think you alluded to it, Valerie. Uh, data is just in different spots, and it's not connected. And there are things that you have to consider when you start connecting data um, from an ethical perspective as you connect certain types of data, especially as we move into some of the social determinant data, consumer data, et cetera. I think that's one, of, uh, one challenge. Um, I think the other is, um, from a regulatory perspective, I know in my world, uh, 42 CFR, which governs a lot of substance abuse related data, presents challenges. And I get why they're there. I mean, I get the idea of protecting privacy and wanting to, to not inadvertently disclose something. Um, but then it, it does make it more challenging. And then from a philosophical perspective, I wonder if we continue to treat mental health data and substance use data as very, very different from other forms of data. Do we continue to perpetuate a stigma around those issues? So I'll get off that little soapbox for a moment. And then I think the last one is really scaling, is how do you take, because we know it has to happen in a very hyper-local, as you're describing um, what the work that you're doing, Valerie, that it can't be done from this remote space. So how do you take these great, wonderful pilots that are happening and spread them in a way that, that works from not just a health outcomes perspective, but from a, um, a financial perspective. And I think that's where we have to look at how do you um, stop siloing budgets. I think you know if you look at most communities, they've got like an education budget, a health budget, a social services budget, and mm -hmm. then no, you know, everyone wants to figure out which budget the savings accrue to, and then there's kind of a little bit of elbow throwing. So I think those are probably the biggest ones from my perspective. Chris. I guess uh, I probably would break it down to two main elements. I'm an ex-consultant. I normally talk in threes, but today I guess I'm stuck <laughs> on two. The, the one, uh, you know, I would kind of pile on your data comment. Uh, and I mean, to me, you're even going aspirational about behavioral data and getting integrated. I'm at a more fundamental level just about EMR interoperability. Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds great if the entire health system's on Epic, 
But what about the community providers? If, if everyone's not on the, the same EMR, then even though you know, billions of dollars have been invested in you know, quote, EMR interoperability, it's still not there today. The amount of interactions that happen on either paper fax, e -fax, is still, and then, then you don't have the discrete data. And so um, kind of just even the basic fundamentals of communication when you're going outside your four walls on the provider side is, is really an immense challenge. Now, you've got regional HIEs that are available in some markets, and that's definitely helping. But um, even though there's been immense progress mm -hmm. over the last you know, several decades on data, I still feel like we have a long way to go. So I think that is number one. And the second one is really the, the payment models, the financial incentives. You have, especially on the kind of health system provider side, uh, you know, many of these organizations are in a fee-for-service environment, and if they want to move to value-based care, there's usually significant investments that they need to make. Well, how do they cross that chasm of making those investments? But as they start to make those investments, the benefit actually accrues to some other organization. And, uh, and so kind of navigating that mm -hmm. is, is really challenging. And even the timeline of you know, that investment might pay off five years <laughs> from now. Well, will they have the risk for that patient or not? So I think continuing to align the financial incentives, then that will help enable collaboration, you know, collaborative care to mm -hmm. take hold in more markets. Great. So I guess I would echo the data issue and um, just to expand sort of discontinuity of data uh, inputs and outputs that we are gathering data in many different ways. Those, those um, can include screening tools that have been uh, in place for maybe a decade or more that now have to interact with new ways of looking at healthcare and trying to bring that data forward in new meaningful ways. Also, um, EMRs that don't talk to the other applications that we have to then give data into, and that's kind of cumbersome. But then how do we give data back out to patients and families that's meaningful? Um, the example we have is shared plans of care for um, kids with special health care needs. We deliver care in 50 different languages, so we had a challenge of trying to figure out how could we give a document that the family could take with them that was portable enough but also meaningful to them if they didn't speak one of the three languages that our EMR can produce something in. And um, just to be able to connect a, a universal healthcare symbol onto a piece of paper that comes out of our EMR, it seemed nearly impossible. So those, um, those are some of those types of barriers. There are other issues, though, um, paradigm shifts are, are kind of hard for folks to adopt. The difference between, in our, in our example, the education world and the healthcare world, there are some fundamental issues around just confidentiality, sharing of information that just look different. Um, and then that, as you brought up, Jason, well, graduation rates, how does that even have anything to do with healthcare? Well, Actually, if we start to look at that sort of upward spiral of, of bio, biological health and behavioral health and socioeconomic health, educational health, we can see uh, you know, a trajectory for folks that, that is very real and not really discontinuous, but actually should be continuous. Um, and I guess the last um, thing that I would relate to that would be the time span in which we're looking for a return on investment. So, if we're trying to intervene at the far downstream air level or the, that area of the um, flow where patients are already entrenched in some of their issues, that we can maybe look at those really discrete outcomes that have to do with a specific intervention we made. But if we're trying to intervene upstream, we're going to need to be patient and, and trust we're going to see some return on investment and some change over time. The time span could be longer than what some of the models we're actually operating in right now. So. And then I could just, uh, I'll add a, a couple of uh, challenges that I see as well. From my experience in, in New York, where I led what was called the Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program, DISHRIP, uh, uh, $8 billion program over five years to basically drive collaboration uh, at scale in one of the largest US states. Um, 25 organizations, uh, 90,000 organizations basically coalesced into 25 almost ACO-like entities. Um, you, some cases, maybe a, a hundred or in some cases over a thousand organizations coming together and thousand organizations coming together into a single entity. Um, and I'd say that um, the, the tremendous amount of work and effort went into building those organizations that operate today. Joe Conti and, uh, is the leader of one of those organizations in Staten Island. Um, and uh, I think just two lessons learned from that experience is, first and foremost, is um, organizational history 
um, matters in the sense that uh, uh, while it may seem on paper um, that uh, it makes sense for two organizations to work together, uh, those two organizations may have a lot of bad blood and history between them. Uh, their boards may not like each other. The CEOs may not like each other. Uh, and uh, those, uh, those hard feelings don't just sort of evaporate overnight. Uh, and I think we saw that uh, very much in the case in, in some areas across the New York State, where um, while it made a lot of sense for collaboration to occur, it just we couldn't overcome all that, all that bad blood and history. Uh, and so I think that's uh, sometimes an underappreciated uh, impediment. The second uh, thing I would say is training. We have to remember that in this very big, complex thing we call uh, American healthcare, it's a sixth of our economy, thousands and thousands of people operating in it, making decisions every day. Almost none of them got any exposure and training uh, while they were in their uh, in, uh, higher education programs. Uh, masters, PhDs, medical schools, uh, in how to collaborate across multiple organizations, uh, how to work in that sort of diffuse power structure. Um, many of them were, were uh, taught how to effectively run uh, emergency rooms or how to manage groups of physicians, um, how to do those kinds of activities. But uh, what's being asked now uh, in these collaborative efforts is really a different skill set. And I think we shouldn't be surprised that it takes time for the ACOs and the organizations that are being created as collaboratives for them to be successful um, because uh, we, don't, we haven't really invested in the training and skills. And I think it's going to be important for us, important for this school, uh, to uh, see that potentially as part of their mission is to create uh, opportunities to support those professionals who are trying to be those disruptors, the ones who are trying to work across uh, institutional boundaries to try to bring collaboration to the ground in communities across the country. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up. We've got about 20 minutes, uh, so plenty of opportunity for questions. And I uh, have high, high expectations from this audience that uh, mm -hmm. there'll be some questions. And one right out of the box over here. Yes, sir, with your hand up. You are, the, you are question number you one. Question number. I don't know where the mics are, but. Uh, OK. Good question. So uh, there are multiple, I, the way I would answer this and open it up to the, the panel as well, is what I would say is there are multiple versions of collaboration that are possible out there. And uh, the accountable care organization is one model. Uh, states um, uh, and the federal government uh, define accountable care organizations in somewhat unique ways. But generally speaking, it's a number of different healthcare organizations and other organizations as well that come together sort of a vertically, horizontally integrated uh, entity. Um, but um, not only across the United States, but across m much of the developed world, you see organizations, um, maybe they may have different names. So in the case of New York, we called them performing provider systems. Here in uh, Massachusetts, they're called ACOs. Um, they're called ACHs in, um, in the state of Washington. Uh, they're CCOs in Oregon. They, while they all have slightly different names and slightly different purposes, I think the, the commonality is that there are multiple organizations uh, that come together uh, to be held collectively accountable for improving the health of the population that they serve, uh, but they don't all go work for one single organization. Uh, so I don't know if anybody wants to add to that. Do you want to about? Yeah, and I was thinking about that, actually, that question in terms of the definition that you had provided. Mm -hmm. And um, I had thought about the, again, qualifying that word, allowing organizations to kind of work together is to expect and reward organizations for working together. And that's the ACO model is, is somewhat of an expectation in the accountable piece. But that doesn't mean that the free market can't also join and the public sector can't also join outside of a model that expects and, and um, holds people accountable in that way. Sorry, I just have a little follow up before you go to me. So going back to what Chris said, how can you bring a fee for service guy and a value guy together to collaborate? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's an mm -hmm. elephant question, right? <laughs> that, that, no, I, it, and it, it is a challenge because the fee for service, you have distinct incentives, and those incentives don't necessarily uh, align with the uh, incentives from, from value based. And I think you know the ACO constructs, some of the you know initial constructs that the governments have put out, 
for attempts to you know, create a different incentive structure. And you know, I, I'm a you know, landmark, we take upside, downside risk. And I think a lot of those structures were, well, you know, if you do something, you know, we'll reward you. It's like, like my, my daughter's, you know, like if you do something, I'll give you a cookie. Well, but if you don't do something, you know, what's kind of that trade off? I, I think the more we, we need to move to more where you know, every organization actually has meaningful skin in the game. Mm -hmm. And so even if that fee for service, uh, you know, they need to have you know, fee uh, reductions or other things where, hey, if they don't participate in a collaborative manner, that there's, uh, you know, there's some repercussions for that. Um, it's by no means easy. That's why you see several models, some with different levels of success. And that's why I think uh, from a market standpoint and a legislative standpoint, we need to keep uh, pushing mm -hmm. on that so we can find the right models that can bring those different actors together. Great. Just add from a free market perspective that it could take a cadre of mission-driven entrepreneurial innovators who really actually have that mission-driven aspect to the, the way that they have an outlook on their work. We, we are a mission-driven organization as a community health center, so we hire for that. So you know, the, we, identifying those, those organizations, those businesses that might be interested. Next question. Sal. Good afternoon. Again, thanks for sharing, and I work with Joe Conti here, Staten Island PPS. Um, Part of collaboration from my point of view is communication. So we heard about the great red bag, right? Um, maybe starting with the disruptor, because I feel an affinity for disruptors, <laughs> uh, and working side to side. How do you collaborate? How do you share information consistently? Um, uh, it sounds like you're working with employees, employee-based uh, health system. Well, no, so we're, we're an employee-based medical group. Uh, and so um, we then interact within a community. We interact with primary care groups, specialists, health systems. So, so here's a diverse population. You have the primary care docs who may or may not have EHRs, the specialists who may or may not have EHRs, community-based organizations that may or may not be assisting you, the nursing homes and the home care agencies. And I probably left out two or three others. So how do you create a, a, some sort of continuity of care document so that people who are interested maybe at 2 o'clock in the morning because they have insomnia and want to know what's going on, have a sense of where everyone else who is touching this patient has interact with them and improve things. And so maybe to I'll break it into two parts again. I think that the first part is you know, we built our own EMR. Um, I've worked in the past and been forced to use some of the off-the-shelf EMRs, which you know, in my opinion are more revenue cycle collection engines. At least that's what my physicians keep uh, you know, telling me. You know, so our EMR, we, we built it for longitudinal care. So whether it was the psych MP that visited the patient, uh, whether it was the nurse care manager that made the call, whether it was a note um, that came in from the primary care provider, we put that all in. And so when you pull up our Joe or our Josephine, you can see here's all the different touches that have happened. And, uh, and then for the community providers, we provide you know, read access so that they can look at their specific panel of patients. So that's how we try and use technology to really uh, enable that, uh, that communication. And then I think you know, a lot of it is it does vary on market. You know, we're in a multiple different markets, and you know, healthcare is local. And to your point, hey, that uh, PCP group, they don't have any HR. So then it's text, it's phone calls, it's, you know, doing, it's having that type of touch point. And so we really need to, and then that's where we rely on those local relationships. You know, what's right, what's the, you know, the right mechanism for each of those um, you know, partners to interact with them. Wherever there's an HIE in the market, we absolutely do. And that's really critical for us because we want timely data. If one of our patients gets admitted to the hospital, uh, if they get discharged, we get you know, health plan data. Uh, we get calls sometimes from the um, admitting uh, department. But you know, that HIE allows us very time sensitive information so then we can directly uh, connect with our patient to develop the discharge plan, make sure we've got visits set up. And so yeah, HIEs are critical. I'd love to see them in every single market, uh, that, that I think that's a huge benefit. Yes, question over here. Hi, um, I'm from Avia Health Innovation, and um, we have a network of 42 health systems who are collaborating together on digital innovation. Um, and my question for you is, um, in terms of collaboration and scale, how do you see collaboration um, uh, helping to achieve results at scale? Good question. Scale. Anyone want to take that on? 
I mean, scale's always a, <laughs> scale's a challenge, right? And that, I mean, you come back to my comment around healthcare is local. Uh, I, I've worked in a number of different industries before I uh, got into healthcare, and you know, a lot of other industries, you figure out a model, and then you franchise it, you cut and you, know, mm -hmm. you copy paste. Healthcare is not, not like that. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, the panel, we all talked about data. Getting continuity of data, and that's where the HIEs mm -hmm. are important, interoperability mm -hmm. at EMR, so that whether you go into you know, Phoenix or you go into Minneapolis, the, right, you know, the, the similar kind of data sets are available to the, the community there. I, I come back to that, so mm -hmm. that's a key element. And then yeah, just on the financial model, I kind of pound my uh, fist on that as well. You know, if, if you're setting up similar incentives around the, you know, the country, then you know, market forces will, will, you know, take the, you know, will take over and people will you know, likely land in a similar spot. But, it's, it's not easy. Uh, yeah, healthcare is local. Everything's very unique. And I think having an appreciation for that and, and how you um, address that with those kind of supporting uh, factors, well, then that's, uh, it's a long road, but that's kind of I think, the road we need to start to go down. Well, I think the other challenge with collaboration at scale is, is I think, building on the training issue is that, you know, in, in behavioral health, we have areas of the country that there is not a behavioral health provider for miles. Um, if at all. So, you know, how do we do the training, but then also how do we leverage other forms of technology, digital visits, um, you know, virtual visits rather, um, virtual rounds, ways to, to um, make that collaboration work. There's been, an, and then that ties to payment because it's not until recently were these virtual visits reimbursable in any way. So it was always like extra work. So I think that's is how do we use a lot of the technologies to bring those, those groups of providers together um, is another a key strategy we need to figure out how to do better with. I think we can also look at um, professional associations for, in our example, we're in the community health space and community health center space. So overarching organizations that are collecting data and are always looking at ways in which we're being effective in our delivery. So HRSA is our major funder. Um, and there's a whole data set of quality indicators that goes along with what they're asking us to do. In that school-based health um, example I gave, there's a school-based health alliance. They're collecting data and they're promulgating quality measures. And so we can be looking across the, the entire nation while we're still doing local care. Um, so, and I wanna actually respond back to that question around communication because I think we, we talked, Andrew talked about the patient yeah. and not leaving out the patient. And I would love to see us, while we're trying to connect all these different types of applications together so we clinicians can communicate, really love to see us leading with the patient portal with our EMRs so that the patient carries with them their mobile app that has their health record that even if our EMRs don't talk to each other yet, the patient mm. can produce their own record wherever they go. Most of our patients have smartphones and could access. Our patient portal is not all that user friendly, but we, we could do a better job. So. Yeah, and I, I would say too is I think when I, I agree 100% with the, with the concept that uh, healthcare is local or at its greatest regional. Um, and, uh, and most care is provided you know, within a relatively modest distance of where someone lives. And really, the, where is collaboration most important? It's amongst the providers that serve the same patients. And so we really need that, that local collaboration to occur. And so I actually think that while there's you know, a tumultuous period in American national politics, and, uh, and maybe with the, with the most recent elections, not a lot of new big policy coming out of Washington, um, I think that really with the, the kind of the place where I think innovation potentially is the most exciting, where collaboration really needs to occur, uh, is at that very local level. Um, the red bag example was in a, a community just outside London. Uh, no one told them um, about it. Uh, they came up with it themselves, and they were sitting around a table saying, hey, we collectively serve this, this very complex, vulnerable population. What can we do to better serve those people? Um, it didn't require a big IT investment, and it didn't require a complex uh, system solution, uh, but it, it required trust. Uh, it required um, a willingness to uh, work together uh, to see the world through some other organization's eyes and, and, uh, and try something new. And I think that's, 
um, the kind of uh, thing that's possible uh, in any community, uh, in any state in this country. And I think that's one of the things that makes this uh, potentially a very exciting time, is that I think collaboration can be done in literally adding setting. Some places, rural places, have different challenges than urban places. Uh, but I honestly, I think at the end of the day, it, it, it can be a strategy that could be successfully deployed anywhere. Next question. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca, and um, I I appreciate the uh, the range of topics from uh, today overall, from the social determinants of health to the future um, uh, futuristic uh, models for care. But I guess what I'm I'm curious about is uh, the the models that are addressing the inequity in care today and, and the people, the actors that are addressing these factors today, are you thinking about um, these emerging care um, interventions and opportunities um, to ensure that the inequity doesn't perpetuate mm -hmm. for the future models? Yeah. The world of healthcare is constantly changing. Technology is advancing at an advancing rate. How does that affect collaboration? Do you think that these collaboratives are going to harness the power of that technology or and make lives better, raise all boats, or are we in for uh, uh, even greater disparities than we have today? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Hmm. Half full? Half full? I, 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 I are on the side of optimism, but I'm also pragmatic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think that there's a long way to go in this area. I think that one of the things that I have cut lots of conversations at Optum with my colleagues is, you know, what is the, what is the role of the healthcare system, and then what is the role of a social service system, and, a, and, and how do we uh, negotiate those boundaries, or how do we begin to erase those boundaries? Because, as we heard in the morning, you know, providing meals isn't something you typically think of as a standard healthcare activity, but it definitely has healthcare ramifications. And I think until we get to a place, I think, in a from a societal perspective where we see this all is together and fund it in that way. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm a, you know, this siloed funding is I think is what's, what makes it hard for us. Um, and like I said at Optum, I'll get in these conversations and they'll be like, well, what are you proposing? That we, we become a real estate uh, company and have a whole real estate arm, and I'm like, well, you guys acquire stuff all the time, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but you know, and, and I see that point is is like, how do you, like, where does it stop? Mm -hmm. Like, wh who does what, and, and then how do we do it? So, um, pragmatically, we've got some ways to go, but I hopefully we'll get there before what was it, 2069 or whatever. <laughs> Chris. Yeah, I'm, I'm always optimistic. Uh, I think you know, on the inequities issue, uh, you know, I think it kind of comes down to, I mean, you hit on looking at it funding as a whole. I think that's right. And I think also looking at that individual patient, you know, the, uh, our patient who's 76 year old with six chronic conditions, what they need in that holistic is very different than someone who you know, is 50 years old with maybe one chronic condition. And so really looking at how do you personalize healthcare and leverage that whole across all the different community assets and uh, care providers to give them what they need for their you know, longitudinal care. Uh, I think that's another key element mm -hmm. to then you know, better address those inequalities. Valerie? So I'm also an optimist and I would say that um, knowledge is power and this is all about delivering information in some ways and so that the more that we can deliver information and um, opportunity for patients to really take hold of their own agency, whether it's through technology or direct care or collaborations, the more that we can bring people to a new state of um, improved equity. So I'm totally optimistic. All right. Love the optimism. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. How you engage patients, and uh, you mentioned uh, uh, portals or uh, apps on a smartphone, but things like uh, using uh, fitness trackers or watches. What are your thoughts about uh, how to take advantage of those things to change patient behavior, uh, given the immediacy and potential opportunities for greater awareness mm -hmm. than just a sick visit interaction or something else? Uh, so I'd love to hear all three of you or all four of you comment on that. So uh, yeah, patient, uh, 
patient engagement um, is a challenge. I think, I think what I've been really trying to work with in our space is we need to do all, all ways of engaging. Some folks want to be contacted by phone, some want a letter, some want, well, email is a whole separate problem, but secure email, um, and then some want a face-to-face -face visit. And uh, I think some like the digital um, apps and things that they can communicate that way. So I think the, the, um, the solution there is really beginning to ask individuals how they want to be communicated with about different things. And I've been thinking about like, you know, when you go onto a bank or a credit card company or something, they'll, they'll have several ways. They'll say, how do you want to know about, um, uh, you know, a potential fraud or your regular statements? And I pick different ones. Like if it's some fraud to my account, I want to know that right away. Uh, my statement, I don't need to know that right away. So I think if we can begin to uh, give more choices, even in just that patient preferences or member preferences space, that could be a start. Is you know, routine things this way, text me, call me, et cetera. My answer might sound a little flippant, and I, I don't mean it to be, but you know, with Landmark, we offer 24 by seven in-home coverage you know, to send out a provider. And so when you call but somebody and say, hey, do you want that service, <laughs> and it's free, you know, we get a very high engagement rate. And then you know, how do we engage and interact with them? And, you know, they are very elderly uh, patients. We can't a lot, uh, rely a lot on you know, smartphones or Fitbits or other gadgets. But to me, it comes back to meeting that patient and their family with you know, what are they pressed with now? Do they get lab results? Well, then they can call our nurse care manager. So what is top of mind from them uh, with their overall health and being able to provide a timely and, and helpful response? That, that to me is kind of key to not only you know, getting them to engage, but then continuing to engage mm -hmm. so that you can provide that longitudinal care uh, over the rest of their life. So in the last few seconds, I guess I would say around M Health, with great prudence and discernment, there are some issues around HIPAA and confidentiality and privacy that we need to really explore more fully, but I do believe there's great potential there in terms of apps. Um, I think engaging patients kinesthetically across the mind-body Continuum is something we haven't really touched on at all, but that's mm -hmm. a big aspect of health that we have a lot of potential to impact. <clears throat> and finally, I believe that we really uh, can't lose that incarnational aspect of touch and really being with people, um, even if we're doing things electronically. So, And the last thing I would add is just that um, I think patient-level incentives, financial incentives, need to be much more on the table than they have been. I know it creates some interesting moral questions that as a society we need to address. But I'll just give you one example of a program that's been massively successful. So there's a, a program that was launched in New York City targeting individuals with AIDS, HIV at high risk of transmission um, and ba paid them basically $250 per quarter to come in and have blood work done. But with that blood work, not only do they have to get the blood work done, but if their viral loads came back suppressed, adequately suppressed, that it was a clear signal that they had, had been taking their antiretrovirals and that they were basically no longer capable of spreading the disease. It basically took a population that uh, had a pretty high risk of, of transmission to basically zero rates of transmission. And I think it's $250 per quarter, $1,000 per year to basically prevent the spread of an amazing, expensive, and lifelong disease. I think we need to start thinking seriously about getting the patient engaged uh, in our value-based payment conversations. And it's not just about providers and payers but actually the individuals and think creatively about that. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, panel. Um, hope folks were on this interesting and uh, look for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Jason, thank you. Valerie, Chris, Andrew, thank you very much.